and welcome to another episode of Zeno's Live. Today we have Mr. Fahad with us and we will be going through infrared spectrography. Over to you, Mr. Fahad. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Fahad Ansari and uh, today we'll be covering an important topic uh, that is infrared spectroscopy, which is part of the AS level chemistry syllabus. Um, it's not a very complicated or a very lengthy topic, but it's still does confuse a few students, right? And it's very important, especially because it comes up a lot in paper one, which is MCQs, and it does come up in paper two. And in paper two especially, um, we do have a lot of interesting questions, um, which are phrased in a very indirect or in a very different way, right? So that is why I believe we should get through this topic and revise it for the greater good of all the students appearing in these exams. Okay, so infrared spectroscopy is an analytical technique that basically helps us um, gain an insight into what bonds are present in an organic molecule, right? Organic molecules, basically these contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, even nitrogen, right? So what bonds do we have between these atoms, right? Uh, this is basically um, explored using infrared spectroscopy, right? And uh, this is usually done using infrared radiation, right? Uh, this is part of the electromagnetic spectrum with a frequency that is just lower than uh, visible light, right? So infrared light or infrared radiation is uh, what is used to bombard molecules with certain bonds and this causes certain vibrations within these molecules and that is what we detect and that is what helps us determine structures so let's get into the details the deep dive all right so as i said infrared spectroscopy this helps us identify certain bonds within organic molecules and uh, we know that infrared radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, what we do is we pass infrared radiation over a sample of the compound being analyzed, and we keep varying the frequency within the infrared range, right? And what happens is that different bonds, they absorb IR radiation or infrared radiation at different frequencies, right? So different frequencies, which cause them to vibrate more than usual. So there's a certain frequency at which a certain bond is going to vibrate more than usual. And as a result, it's going to absorb the infrared rays at that frequency. And so there will be less infrared rays that are transmitted through to the detector, right? And so that gives us a low percentage transmittance and that is what is plotted on a graph, right? So basically we have uh, the speed of uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is basically the speed of light, right? You know, the speed of light is a well-known constant. And uh, over here, this can be given by frequency times the wavelength, right? So the frequency is in hertz and the wavelength is in meters, right? These are the SI units. Now the thing is that the EM radiation, this speed remains constant as I told you. And so we can determine that the frequency is direct, sorry, inversely proportional to the wavelength, right? When you increase the frequency, the wavelength decreases, right? In order to keep this guy constant. Then once the compound has been analyzed, we basically draw a graph. And on the y-axis, we have percentage transmittance, right? Basically, percentage transmittance is uh, the intensity of the infrared radiation that passes through a sample, right? So some of the intensity is going to be absorbed, and some of it is going to be transmitted through the other side. And that is what a detector captures, right? And that percent transmittance is going to be on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we're going to have wave number. Now, what is this mysterious fellow called a wave number? 
this is basically kind of related to wavelength, right? Except what we do over here is uh, we take the reciprocal of wavelength, right? First, what we do is we convert the wavelength into centimeters, right? Usually wavelength is expressed in nanometers or micrometers, right? It's very small, right? But what we do is we convert that into centimeters and then one divided by the wavelength gives us a wave number, which is a unit of per centimeter, right? And uh, we know that because the frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. In other words, the frequency when it increases, the one over wavelength increases. In other words, the wave number increases. So in other words, wave number is another way of saying frequency, right? When the wave number is high, the frequency of the radiation is high. And that is what we plot on the x-axis. So I know it's a weird way of expressing frequency, but uh, that's the standard that is being followed, right, in IR spectroscopy, right? It makes things a little easier, right? Uh, rather than using uh, frequency values that are either very high or very low, wave number in per centimeter basically has reasonable values to work with and understand and wrap your head around. Okay, so the graph is basically an almost straight line, right? So if I draw a rough example of a graph over here, I have a percent transmittance over here. And on the x-axis, I have the wave number. So what happens is, by default, the transmittance is 100%, right? Now, if at some wave number or some frequency, a certain bond within the molecule absorbs infrared radiation, then uh, the transmittance is going to decrease, and it's going to show up something like this. And then maybe at another frequency, there's another bond that absorbs some infrared radiation. And so the percent transmittance becomes lower than 100% at that wave number as well. So you get a graph that looks something like this, right? So these absorptions, now this over here is called an absorption. You can think of these as downward facing peaks, right? Even though peaks are actually facing upwards, but uh, uh, if you tilt your head a little, then <laughs> this will look like these are upside down peaks, right? But uh, the technical word is absorption, and we're gonna go with that, okay? So we have these absorptions that will basically, but they match with the wave number, right? Then we can look up a table that uh, gives us the bond that corresponds to a certain wave number of infrared radiation. And uh, that is how we identify which bonds are present in a given molecule, OK? Right, so for example, we have this uh, graph over here. You have percent transmittance on the y-axis, wave number on the x-axis. And uh, one important thing is that uh, one weird thing these guys do is they basically start the wave number axis on the right, and they go to the left, right? So you're going to read it from right to left rather than left to right, okay? So you're going backwards, okay? So you're gonna be starting from this end and going towards that direction. All right, so now we have quite a few absorptions over here. Now this might look a little messy, right? But uh, the good news for A-level students is uh, that pretty much all the absorptions that you see below 1,000 per centimeter are basically not included in the syllabus, right? So all of this, all of this, um, as far as uh, you guys are concerned, this is all just noise, right? You don't need to co be concerned about this. Just look at whatever's on the left of 1,000 or whatever is at greater than 1,000 per centimeter in terms of wave number for the absorptions, okay? 
Right. So I'm going to highlight some uh, absorptions over here and match them with certain bonds in the table that will be given to you in the exam. So this is the table that will be given, right? You have a certain bond. For example, over here, you have a carbon-oxygen single bond. Uh, now, this can exist either in the hydroxy group, right? So you have a COH, or you can have it in the ester, right? So you have a C double bond O and a C single bond O, right? Uh, that uh, share a common carbon atom. And this is going to be the range of the um, wave numbers within which the absorption can appear for this carbon-oxygen single bond. So if I mark out this particular peak over here, this is at around uh, this is at around 3,000 per centimeter, right? And if I look at the bonds that uh, fall within this range, uh, I will see that it's the oxygen-hydrogen single bond that falls within this range, right? So you have 2,500 to 3,000 per centimeter, and this is at around 3,000 per centimeter, and you can see that this absorption started before 3,000, right? So because it took an earlier start, right, the lowest point was at 3,000, but the absorption started at a lower wave number. So that is why I will say that this OH bond over here comes from a carboxyl group, right? So basically CO2H, this is the OH in that particular functional group. Then I have this guy over here in blue, right? Now, if I draw this down here, this is going to be somewhere around 1700 per centimeter, right? Now, this over here can be either of these particular functional groups. It's going to be a carbon-oxygen double bond, that's for sure. Now, in which setting is it going to be? That depends on the range of wave numbers uh, within which this absorption over here is going to fall. Now, the problem is that it falls within the ranges of pretty much all of these guys, right? So we have to put information together, right? We know that this OH, this OH bond is within the carboxyl group because its absorption neatly fell into this range. So we know that C double bond O will also be a carboxyl C double bond O. This will be part of the carboxylic acid functional group. So we know that this compound over here has C double bond O, single bond O, H, right? So you have a carboxylic acid group. And finally, we have this peak over here on this downward facing peak or absorption. Now, if I plot this down from the lowest point of the absorption, this is approximately 1100 per centimeter. And so this falls within this range over here. So this tells us it's going to be C single bond O, and that's over here. So we detected C single bond O and C double bond O and basically O single bond H. So we have detected all of these bonds within the carboxylic acid functional group. So these absorptions tell us that for sure we have a CO2H functional group in this compound. And uh, as far as uh, all of these guys are concerned, this little mess over here, now, the thing is that all of these are in between um, basically 1,200 and 1,500, right? So these are between 1,200 to 1,500. Now, the thing is that uh, as far as the bonds in your syllabus are concerned, uh, there are no bonds that have uh, wave numbers corresponding to them, right? corresponding to the infrared radiation that they absorb and vibrate at, there are no bonds in this list, right? You will not find a 1200 to 1500 range, right? For any bond. So again, this is also just noise. So in short, the most important bonds that you're gonna deal with are going to be at 1500 per centimeter or above.
there's only one bond that is going to appear before 1500 per centimeter on the right of it, which is this C single bond O over here within this particular range that I've already pointed out. Okay. So we have got the carboxylic acid functional group, and that is what this IR spectrum, that is what this graph is called. It's called an infrared spectrum. That is what this tells us. All right. Now, another uh, interesting thing to note is that there are two bonds, which are OH and NH. These guys show especially broad peaks in an IR spectrum. And the reason is because we have a hydrogen that is bonded to oxygen or nitrogen, and this will result in hydrogen bonding between molecules, right? Now, hydrogen bonding tends to be strong between molecules, okay? And as a result, if uh, an OH or NH absorbs radiation at a certain wave number in order to vibrate, because the hydrogen is uh, trapped in hydrogen bonding with other molecules, uh, this type of intermolecular force is kind of strong. So you need a wider range of wave numbers, right, for that infrared radiation to actually make this OH or NH bond vibrate effectively right and give you a low transmittance that is going to be detected and recorded on the ir spectrum like over here in this particular case you had this peak that represented oh you saw that this was much wider this was much wide or broad peak or absorption than all the others and it was because of the hydrogen bonding that this fellow over here is involved with. And because of that, it hinders the vibration of the OH bond, right? All right. So now that we're done with the basic concepts, let's get to the workout, all right? And uh, let's get to the questions, especially the ones that are more interesting that have come up in past papers. All right, so we're going to start with the MCQ questions. Very simple, right? So we have an inferred spectrum. Now, what could be the identity of this particular compound, right? So you have the table over here. This will be given to you in the exam, right, within the question. Um, so don't need to worry about it. All right, so over here we have this wide, broad peak over here. And uh, its lowest point is at 3000, right? So we know that for a fact, this is going to be an OH bond, right? And we're also going to be looking at this peak over here. And this peak is at around 1700. So this will be C double bond O. And uh, you can also see this fellow over here with a wave number of uh, close to 1100. So this detects this guy. So just like in the example that we did earlier, we have the telltale signs of a carboxylic acid functional group, right? We have the OH bond, which is over here. We have the C double bond O, which is right here. And we have the C single bond O, which is up here. So as a result, out of all of these, it's going to be propanoic acid because that contains the carboxylic acid functional group. Very simple question to start off with. Right, now here's an interesting question. It says over here that we have the molecular formula of Z and the infrared spectrum of Z is shown, right? Now, the thing is, before I get into the infrared spectrum, uh, the molecular formula itself is going to eliminate one option, right? And that's going to be option C. The reason is that uh, the molecular formula tells me there's only one oxygen atom in the entire molecule. But this guy over here has two oxygen atoms, right? So option C is incorrect. All right. As for the rest of them, uh, if I try to explore, then we have the first option, option A. This is going to be CH3. 
is going to be CH2, C double bond O, CH3. So that's four carbon atoms, one, two, three, and four. And we have eight hydrogens. So this is correct in terms of molecular formula. This is going to be CH2 at option B. This is going to be CH. This is going to be CH2. This is going to be CH2 as well. And this is also correct molecular formula. And this guy over here, option D, this is going to be CH2, CH, CH2, CH2, OH, right? So again, four carbon atoms, and we have eight hydrogen atoms. So this is also correct. So only one option was eliminated because of the molecular formula. Now we need to look at the infrared spectrum. All right, so over here you can see that, again, we have a nice broad peak or absorption. And the lowest point is around here. And if I count, this is 31, 32. So approximately at 3,300, we have this particular peak, right? Now, 3,300 lies within this range over here. So it's safe to say that this is going to be hydroxy, right? The OH bond is going to be an alcohol functional group. And uh, another thing that confirms that is the fact that uh, I do not have any C double bond O in this because there are no absorptions within the 1600 to 1800 range. 1600 is over here and 1800 is over here so i have a whole lot of nothing over here okay right now as for the rest of it as for the rest of this we have over here this is the peak which is at about 1050 that is c single bond o over here that is also part of the OH group, by the way, right? C, single bond O, single bond H. And over here, we have this interesting peak or absorption. Now, this uh, absorption over here, though, you might be thinking that it's kind of within the uh, C double bond O range. But the thing is that whenever you have a C double bond O, it tends to manifest itself not as one clean absorption which is nice and pointy and downwards like this, it shows up as, you could say, a bit of a forest, right? Multiple peaks pointing downwards, right? So this nice clean peak over here, if I go down, this is at around, we could say, 1630 per centimeter. And this falls with another range, which is this guy. And this is for a carbon-carbon double bond. So as a result, we only have one option which has a carbon-carbon double bond and an OH group, right, which is going to be option D. Now we get to some interesting paper two questions. All right. Now the thing over here is, it says H and I are isomers with the molecular formula C2H4O2. The infrared spectra of isomers H and I are shown, right? Now it says over here, identify the bonds responsible for the principal peaks above 1500 per centimeter in each spectrum, okay? So when we go for H, the spectrum for H, we have this broad absorption over here. This is obviously going to be about 3,100 per centimeter, this is going to be OH, right? So we have, we're going to write over here, absorption at around 3,100 per centimeters, which is the OH single bond, right? And now it says over here that we need to identify all of them above 1,500 per centimeter, right? So this is going to be the cutoff over here. We're not going to read anything to the right of this. So this is all noise as far as we're concerned. We have to move in this direction. Now this absorption over here, this peak, this is at around 
1700 per centimeter, right? And this can actually tell us that this is going to be a carbon oxygen double bond, right? So you could say, and at around 1700 per centimeter, this is going to be the carbon oxygen double bond, okay? Now, if you look at spectrum I over here, now this is going to be, um, we have this tiny little peak over here. This is not broad at all. So this is not going to be OH. Although this is pretty close to 3000, this is around 2950 per centimeter, right? And uh, this is another absorption that we have up here. So this is around 17, let's say 20. This is going to be C double bond O. So I can say over here that we have an absorption or a peak, a downward facing peak at around 1720 per centimeter. This is going to be C double bond O. And at 2950 per centimeters. Now, what is this? Let's go back. Okay, so 2950 actually falls neatly within this particular range, which is the CH single bond, which is the alkane, right? So this is going to be CH single bond. Now, it says name H and I. Now, we can actually determine the structure. It's a very small molecule with this formula. And we have identified some bonds, okay, right? And uh, just to be absolutely sure, this particular absorption over here for the C double bond O, now this can actually be a carboxyl group, right? So if uh, we assume that that is the case, then for H, you're going to have C double bond O and C single bond O, single bond H. So you have this bond over here and this bond that were detected. And uh, if I have the rest of the formula in front of me, I have C2H4O2. I've already used up the two oxygens. I've used up one carbon and I've used up one hydrogen. So I'm left with CH3. So this is going to be CH3 over here. So this is very simple. This is ethanoic acid. And when it comes to uh, compound I over here, right? So I have a C double bond O, and that's pretty much the only uh, special bond that we have, right? Well, the thing is that we also have an oxygen, right? There's another oxygen in play. So what we can do, what we can do is uh, have a C single bond O over here, right? Now, the thing is that we don't have an OH. We need to have a carbon right here, okay? So this is uh, going to be the CH3, and we have an H over here, and that completes the formula. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is an ester, right? It's an ester. It does not have any OH single bonds that are not shown in the spectrum, by the way. And uh, we have only a C, O, double bond that is visible above 1,500 per centimeters. So this ester, by the way, is going to be ethyl methanoate, right? We have ethyl methanoate, and by the way, we know that, um, you know, two structural isomers, you know, if I have a carboxylic acid, I can have an ester with the same molecular formula, but a different structural formula. This is an example of functional group isomerism, right? Another thing that you can revise regarding organic chemistry. All right. So over here, we have another interesting question. It says over here that uh, we have a reaction scheme over here. We have two reactions. And uh, this part over here is focusing on reaction two. 
says it can be monitored by infrared spectroscopy, right? So the absorption caused by OH bonds is always present because water is used as a solvent. So we have to identify two absorptions and the bonds responsible for these absorptions whose appearance will change, right? This will change from the compound U, that's the reactant, and compound V, that's the product. So from U to V. So we need to identify two bonds that are different, okay? And no, we cannot use OH over here because it says that the OH bonds will always be present because of water that is the solvent. So what else is present? We have a carbon oxygen single bond over here. And in V, we do not have carbon oxygen single bond. We have a carbon oxygen double bond, right? So what we can say is that uh, we have an absorption for the carbon oxygen single bond. And this is, by the way, within this particular range given, right? This will be 1,040 to 1,300 per centimeter. Within this range, you have an absorption for C single bond O, and this disappears, right? Because this bond exists in the reactant, but not in the product. Then there's a new absorption that appears, right? And that absorption is for C double bond O, right? And this is in the range, by the way, because uh, this C double bond O is bonded to two carbon atoms over here. So this is going to be for uh, a ketone. So this is carbonyl, right? So this is a carbonyl C double bond O. So I'm going to go this particular range. This is going to be 1670 to 1740 per centimeter. And this appears as the reaction goes on, all right? And that is because it's part of the product and not part of the reactant. So this is another interesting question that has come up in the past for infrared spectroscopy. All right, so these were the questions and uh, this was the entire concept of infrared spectroscopy and uh, how this can be used as a useful analytical technique, not just to um, gather what bonds are present in a molecule, but also along with other information, determine the actual structure of the compound and the arrangement of the bonds within that structure of the molecule, and even monitor reactions, right? So uh, that is it for infrared spectroscopy. If you have any questions for me, do leave them in the comments. All right, Ashwarya, that's it for uh, my side. Thank you so much for this wonderful session. It was really interesting. I learned something new today. Um, in the next slide, our social media handles will pop up. You can follow them and stay tuned for another episode. Thank you.